So I, I first started playing piano when I was seven, I believe. Um, or at least that's when I first started getting lessons, but there'd always been a piano in our house, um, in my parents' house. I think I liked playing, but then as soon as I started getting lessons, that was a, a bit of a death knell for that initial interest, because uh, I think lessons kind of kicked the um, spirit out of me a little bit. Not uh, not by any fault of my teacher at the time, just um, <clears throat> I think I was maybe a bit too young to be formally having to do something. Um, and then, I, But then I think I saw I saw the jazz educator Richard Michael play piano uh, when I was about 12 or 13 I think and um, he just made it look like so enjoyable and I'd never it sounds weird but I'd never clocked that playing music could be enjoyable um, which I think is you know generally it puts a lot of people off when it shouldn't because music at the end of the day is like a nice thing to play rather than a high pressure thing to play but I think that was that when I first heard some saw someone playing jazz and it looks like really a lot of fun in it and it didn't suddenly didn't feel all t also scary anymore to like try and do music so that was kind of my uh, introduction to it in a way it's hard there's there's so many great memories i think i first appeared at um the edinburgh jazz festival in 2015 i would say yeah 2015 and um i've done it that was with the trio and i've done it with the trio every year kind of since so almost like it's a for for the for our playing and for our music, it's almost like a bit of a home in a way. Um, it would feel it will feel when the year comes that we don't play Edinburgh Jazz Festival, that will feel very bizarre, I think. Um, but I have a lot of fond memories of playing there with the trio, and I think if you if you'd recorded every gig and then like played them all back to back, you'd see a really interesting development probably in the kind of sound and style of what we're doing and stuff. And then just generally playing with other people's projects that I really. Um, enjoy playing and playing with um, playing with musicians that I really like respect and stuff. But playing with Graham Costello and Matt Carmichael and Mark Hendry and um, just really great people. And, and playing with Tommy Smith actually last year was really really great. Um, but just generally being in the city when there's so much jazz going about and when all the musicians are there and um, when there's so much great music, um, yeah, I just uh, it's great. I really really do love it. Yeah, the, the album artwork's a, a really nice story, actually. So um, we decided, so when when I signed with Edition, we decided really early on, I think, that Cairn was going to be the album uh, title. This was way back um, in February, I think, of 2020. And then a few months later, um came to the point where the artwork needed to happen. So I set up a Skype meeting with Dave, who's in charge of Edition, and um, Ollie, who designs the artwork for Edition, and just we we were just talking about what the album kind of meant and like cool symbols and what Cairn kind of was and stuff. And I think collectively it seemed to come up with this idea that it would be really cool to like go and get some stones from like real Cairns and like use them as kind of the artwork. So I went, um, I went. So my parents live just below the Oakle Hills, kind of in Perthshire, Clitmanshire. Um, so I went back there and then went up um, up into the Oakles and took some stones from Cairns and uh, hurt my shoulders a bit carrying them all down, uh, but got them down in the end and um, boxed them up, sent them off to the addition. Um, and it's ended up that like some of the stones I got were like really, really genuinely very pretty. So for each kind of format of the, of the album, there's like a different stone used. Um, so for, you know, vinyl, one different stone for CD, there's a different stone in the front, and then digital again, different one. And kind of together, they constitute almost this like virtual cairn. Um, I just I have to like give credit to um, the other two at Edition for like uh, coming up with that idea because I think it really actually sums up the album in a way which I can't really articulate that well, but it sums it up um, really nicely, at least in my head. So, Cairn, I wrote. I'm pretty sure usually when I write, I try and like start with like an idea, and if everything kind of springs from that idea, then fine. If if it if nothing springs from that idea, then it gets put in the bin. Um, but I think the first idea I wrote for Cairn was that baseline that David plays in the opening, um, and I've always been really obsessed with um, that Pat Metheny record, eighty eighty one, and there's a song on that. Uh, called Two Folk Songs, um, and in that, Charlie Hayden, who's the bass player, he plays a lot um, 
but with the with his E string, not to get too technical, but with his E string drops down to D. So you get this really low D. So what you actually get across the bass is like D, A, D, and then a G string. And if like you strum kind of all of those actually sounds really nice and harmonious together, especially in, I think that's why I write so much stuff in D major anyway, because it sounds really good on the bass, I think. But especially when for that tune when David kind of tunes down. So I kind of wrote that riff and took it to him and it was, it was actually his idea to tune down. Um, and kind of by doing that, I think it opens with this really nice resonant kind of um, open sound in, in D major really. And then kind of everything just came from there. And I think calling it care and like that really open sound kind of appeals to me in the way that, you know, when you're standing on top of a care and from a hill, that's like a really kind of open view. Your mind, I think when you're in such a, huge vast space your mind kind of really opens up in that way so um it was just kind of trying to convey that that feeling in a way if that kind of makes sense
most of these tunes in the album have been developed on gigs, actually, rather than um, just developed in the studio or whatever. It all kind of, it's very much like the live sound kind of comes through on this album, maybe more so than the first album, I think. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's definitely important to say as well, like obviously I write all the tunes myself, but they would be very different if David and Hendo had never seen them. It happens so often, I'll bring in a tune and David will say, oh, why don't you add an extra bar there? And Hendo will like do a different groove on the drums maybe to what I was expecting. And, and that will like just improve the kind of tune massively. So in that way, the tunes become um, really tunes that are in, inhabited by the trio rather than just being tunes that I happen to have uh, written, which I think is the way I kind of kind of like it. Um, so that's kind of that was kind of my main thought for this album was just trying to really focus on how getting the trio to sound really together and really good and stuff and making it so that, like I say, the compositions weren't just mine, they were, they were all of ours. So, Growing up with folk music and then growing up with my teens playing a lot of jazz music, I think when I write, like hitting that sort of point in between the two really feels like that's where it feels the most comfortable to kind of inhabit. So, um, you know, when I'm playing music by other people, whether I'm like maybe playing Chopin or playing um, playing some like, you know, Jerome Kern songs or playing other people's music as well, that like feels really, really good. But that's like putting on a slight part. Um, whereas like playing this music that I've written because I've really tried to make it feel like it's my own kind of thing, that feels the most comfortable and feels the most um, at home. It's not to say that playing other people's music isn't isn't really enjoyable as well. That's like probably the same level of enjoyment, but I think for doing my own thing, it was really important to me to kind of try and get this, um, get this really comfortable feeling that what I was doing wasn't just an imitation of, of someone else, you know. Out of all the tunes I've written, Jig probably has the least deep meaning um, <laughs> because <clears throat> I really just wrote that because it was nice, I thought it would be nice to have something where we could almost just like play, almost in a way, even though it's called Jig and it's got like a Jig tune, it almost feels like the most jazz tune in a way. Um, not that it's, you know, particularly either, I don't think, uh, not really a huge fan of calling things by genres, but uh, in terms of the way we approach that, it's basically there's like a head and then there's like a solo and then there's a big drum solo and then there's uh, the head out and that's very, structurally that's quite consistent with jazz at least. Um, but yeah, for Jake, I really just wrote that. That was kind of just meant to be a really fun tune. And I think on gigs, I play it almost every gig actually. And on gigs, that usually is a really fun one to play because can really kind of try and, at least improvisation wise, the way the improvisation section is written, it's like almost no chords changes really whatsoever. Um, so it becomes, it can kind of go anywhere in a way as long as it kind of, we stay together. Um, so as as a band, that's like a really nice way, I think, to kind of uh, hit off each other and try and push it, like push it to like a new kind of intensity every time we play it. So, yeah. Um, but there's no, sadly, there's no real deep story beyond behind that one.
David and Stephen. I actually met. I always call him Hendo, uh, but I'll try and call him Stephen. I met. I met Stephen a uh, um, very long time ago. I think because uh, we were both around in Scotland, um, doing youth bands kind of at the same time. Except he was a bit older than me. I didn't meet David until I went to RCS because he actually he's actually from London. Um, but when I got to RCS, they were kind of the the drummer and bassist in fourth year that everyone really wanted to play with. Um, so I, I kind of ended up that I played with them quite a lot. And then I think it was in 2015, like I said, uh, when we first did the Edinburgh Jazz Festival and when Roger, who at the time was running it, he asked, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do a trio with the two of them. Um, just because it felt kind of right at the time. And I think at the time we probably played tunes that would not sound like ours at all. It was just stuff that I'd tried writing. I think we played a couple of their tunes as well. Um, but over time, the more I tried to write stuff, the more I found myself writing um, with them kind of in mind. Um, and I have to say, like, as bandmates, they're, like, perfect, really, because they learn... They learn the music like as soon as I kind of bring it um, and like I say they're really up for like trying lots of stuff different ways and like workshopping it and like giving ideas to stuff and um, just like I think the three of us because we've now played together so much it's hard to imagine doing a trio with like um, other people in a way it really does feel right to play with them um, and I have to say as well like individually I think they're like uh, incredible musicians like D David's well, St Stephen has obviously just got a ridiculous, like, amazing technique on the drums, but also um, such, like, colour that comes from... I almost imagine him more of, like, a, a colourist of the music rather than just a drummer in that way. It's almost like he... Um, every tune, he kind of does the right thing to elevate the tune rather than just playing playing the drums, really. Um, and then David's is, like, one of the most solid... maybe even the most solid bass player I've ever played with, really. Um, it's like very, he's very understated and uh, maybe not necessarily the one that like your instantly ear is drawn to but I think everything he plays again much like Hendo much like the way I always try to try to be at least uh, everything he plays kind of really services the music and he's really like a, a solid foundation for kind of me and Hendo to kind of spring off of um, so yeah I just think it's a combination it's like a way of like playing together so much that um, it just feels really, really natural to play with them. It feels like the same as just like sitting at home practicing and that's kind of the way, the way I, I kind of wanted it to be. So yeah, they're very special musicians though. I'm very lucky to play with them for sure. So when, at the time I wrote Old Friend, I think, you know, like I, I wrote the tune I think I came out again, I think it started with that idea of this kind of slightly moving, uh, not really arpeggio, but sort of moving broken chords at the start. And then that tune seemed to kind of come out really without thinking too much about it, which I kind of think is usually how the good creative stuff happens when you're not really thinking so much. Um, and then I wrote that and didn't think too much about it and then came back to it maybe a few months later and thought, even though it was quite, it didn't really seem like it needed, at the time at least, it didn't seem like it needed other musicians. It felt very much just like a solo piano thing. I thought it would be nice to kind of try because I've been listening to a lot of, um, a lot of uh, Norwegian stuff and especially stuff with uh, Jan Christensen on drums, where so often the time so often there would be time in the piece, but he wouldn't really be playing it. So when I went and brought it to the band, that's what I said to Hendo, like, don't play time in this, just like play colors in a way. Um, and then Dave obviously just, Dave just plays the bass notes and really kind of anchors it. And I think actually having Hendo kind of color it in that way and like shape it really elevates it to being something more than what it is, I think. Um, on its own, it's like maybe like kind of a nice melody with some nice chords, but with Hendo adding that extra kind of touch and with Dave adding that depth, it really kind of um, makes it a kind of deeper thing, I think. Um, it makes it a lot more kind of melancholic. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people might come up to me after gigs um, and ask me, oh, who who is the old friend? Like, who's that about? Um, 
And the answer is actually not really, like, it's not about anyone, to be honest. It's more, it could be about a different person every time, really. It's more that I always try and write for, like, feelings, I think, rather than actually specific things. And that's kind of the feeling of, um, that's kind of the feeling of that rather than a specific kind of um, thing, I think, uh, if that kind of makes sense.